Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Person You Want to Be. I am your host, Eric Teplitz. Today, I am super excited to be joined by world-class mountaineer, accomplished entrepreneur, and inspiring adventurer, Gary Scott. A native of Australia, Gary Scott has been traveling and exploring the world for over 50 years. He has been running his own adventure travel trips since 1982, when he started a trekking and guiding company, Alpine Ascents, in Kathmandu, Nepal, at the age of 24. He has led over 250 international adventure trips, including 40 trips in Nepal and over 100 tours in the Dolomites of Northern Italy, his favorite place in the world. In 1986, Gary set a world record for the fastest unsupported solo ascent of Denali in Alaska. He was the first person ever to climb Denali in a single day, climbing it solo from the 7,000-foot landing strip to the 20,320-foot summit in a superhuman 18 and a half hours, a record time that stood for 27 years. He has been a team member on two successful Mount Everest expeditions, himself reaching 27,500 feet without supplemental oxygen before turning back to assist a sick Sherpa guide. He has also co-led expeditions to Mount Kanchenjunga, the third highest peak in the world, and to the technical Mount Amadablam, as well as to many other big mountains in Nepal. Though now fully retired from mountaineering, Gary still has a huge passion for taking people walking in the mountains. And in 2008, he founded Right Path Adventures, an award-winning international adventure travel company that provides first-class experiences to his clients. On his trips, Gary encourages people to move past their self-imposed doubts and fears. And he has a knack for helping people push themselves beyond what they ever thought they could do or achieve. Over the years, Gary has also authored rock climbing and triathlon guidebooks, as well as the highly inspirational book, Summit Strategies, Secrets to Mastering the Everest in Your Life. Gary Scott, welcome to the person you want to be. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, it's awesome to see you again after such a long time, and I'm so humbled and honored you thought of me and called me and invited me on this show and to be a part of uh, this incredible experience that you're offering people. And I think I got to call you every morning so you could just sort of remind me of some of the stuff <laughs> I've done. It's yeah. awesome. So thank, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate it. And it's an honor to be here. Gary, uh, my words exactly. Really, I'm truly humbled and honored. And I so appreciate you having this conversation with me today. My so pleasure. I'd love to get started with uh, a question I like to ask people. If you can give us a sense, like paint a picture, if you will, of your early childhood and your earliest childhood memory of deciding what it was you wanted to be or the, the, the first sort of sense you got of who you were in the world and what you wanted to do. Wow. Wow. Um... Well, my first memory um, was uh, when I was six years old and <clears throat> we came to the U.S. My father was a, a diplomat and in the military and we came to the U.S. and uh, traveled around for a couple of months before his posting and went to Canada, bam, paddling out in a canoe with my father on Lake Louise. I was from fairly flat area in Australia and I look up at these mountains and something just magical um, magnetic happened and I asked my father a couple of questions and turned to him and said I'm going to be a mountain climber and uh, sort of that destiny was cast and Perhaps a year later, back in Australia, I found out that Mount Everest was the highest mountain on earth, and it became my goal to climb it. And the rest of my life was simply about that, following that pursuit. Wow. So 
I mentioned in the intro your book, Summit Strategies, which I, I know actually was published quite a while ago, but I read it, re reread it recently and was inspired all over again by it. And I'm going to be quoting probably generously throughout this interview, your own words back to you and get your current take on them. And I'd like to start, awesome. I'd like to start with, um, with this, actually, I'm going to just actually read a, a few quotes to whet people's appetites as it were. These are some of the quotes that stood out to me. And especially I have to add in the context in which you present them in the book, because context is everything. But, um, a, a few random quotes here. Everyday life can be an incredible adventure when you truly challenge yourself. Another one, taking risks provides the building blocks to self-knowledge. And then the one that I had in mind to, to as a launching point for this question, I love this. The steps you need to realize any dream, you get started. And learn from whatever comes your way. So you're a young kid and you are infected with this dream. I want to climb Mount Everest someday. You're starting off from someone who lives in Australia. There aren't many mountains around. So where do you begin? Um, you know, I, I look at it as, um, or look back on it as, you know, little just little steps, little things that I did. And I was, um, I've been fortunate in my life to be in situations um, which some people might think are unfortunate, but, you know, being put in boarding school at the age of um, 11. <clears throat> um, but before that, you know, I, I just started doing uh, day hikes. Um, and I remember my parents, me asking that we be allowed to go camping somewhere and then driving us somewhere and dropping us off. And so my mother talked by yourself, about that I would, camping by yourself. Uh, there was a couple other kids, no adults, no adults. Okay. Um, and my mother reminding me years later that I would write lists of what I needed to bring, um, so I was always a list guy. I'm still a list guy. <laughs> Me too. Um, and I, I always use paper, um, you know, rather than just, uh, uh, the computer. Um, but, um, you know, I just, uh, you know, we went camping and then we went climbing and, um, I was lucky, as I said, to go to boarding school and we had a small area in the library, which had books about climbing. And so I just, poured over them um i didn't do too good in school but i would have got an a plus in climbing history um and um you know just gained that knowledge uh, went on school they called it a venture club which i joined and and learned how to cross-country ski and winter camp and go caving and go rock climbing and all those sort of outdoor skills um, and I was also never afraid to ask questions of people and not, you know, a lot of, um, teenagers seems, seem to know it all as opposed to, I always acted dumb, you know, well, what, you know, how do you do this? And why do you do that? And, uh, you know, how do you do that? And, and just, um, uh, you know, being, being with people that were far more experienced with me, why not? ask him a lot of questions and learn. I love that. Uh, I think that for a lot of us, our ego gets in the way. We want to look like we know what we're doing. We want to look impressive to other people. But really, the way that you learn and grow and expand your yourself and your horizons is by doing exactly what you did, mm. is asking questions and you know, uh, not having a problem with not knowing having that kind of beginner's mind and a curiosity and a willingness to learn and not, not being worried about how you're perceived. How or why do you think you had that at such a young age? Um, I don't really know the answer to that, except that um, perhaps, it's a great question, perhaps um, um, 
you know, I never, I never did very well at school. So I considered myself not very smart. And part of it was a combination of things where my parents in the military, we moved every year or two hmm. or six months and from state to state and every state had a different teaching system. And then metric came to Australia and then I needed glasses and I was too embarrassed to wear them. So I didn't. And so there was all these things happening and I wasn't learning and I, I fell behind and I was, um, you know, getting literally straight D's and F's in mm. school. And so I, you know, I, thought I was dumb you know I I just um uh and and so probably a way around that was just to I don't know not play the part but just ask people questions you know can you help me can you <clears throat> how do you how do you do this how do you and not be afraid to put my ego aside and just ask questions, you know, how, and I kind of still do that today where I'm not afraid to, um, and, you know, I live in Slovakia. I don't speak Slovakian. My wife is Slovakian, but <clears throat> she sends me out on errands or we've, you know, we've bought this property and we have to get permits and this and that. And she always sends me to these offices <laughs> because I just act dumb and, you know, um, what do I do? You know, and, and they want to help me. And that's what I found my whole life when people generally want to help you. And rather than being the big shot, the big know-it-all, you know, just, I, I just would humble myself and ask people questions and can you help me? You know, people like to help people. I love that. And it's so interesting because in my coaching, I encounter this so frequently where people feel like they don't want to bother someone. They're, they're either embarrassed to ask for help or they feel like they're putting someone out by doing so. And they have all these, they have all these like apprehensions about it. And I always throw it back to them and I say, well, flip it. What, what, what is your response typically if someone comes to you and asks for mm. help? And usually they're like, oh, I, I love to help them. I'm happy to share what I know. And so exactly. I say, yeah, do you see, do you see what I'm getting at here? <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's, it, it, if I have opportunities like that, it, it's like, oh, here's my opportunity to do my good deed for the day mm. and to help somebody. And it makes, it helps them and it makes me feel good. So, Absolutely. you know, it's, uh, um, it, you know, a lot of people um, struggle with self-image and I did too for a really long time. And it's, you know, it's getting to that point where you feel worthy. Hmm. What was a uh, game changer for you in that regard, would you say? Um, I don't know. I, I got tired of beating myself up. <laughs> you know, I'd done all these pretty cool things. I was living a pretty cool life, but I was always critical of myself. And I remember one day... <clears throat> going into the bathroom and looking in the mirror and I said, you know, Gary, you're okay. You're not perfect. <laughs> and no one is, but you're okay. And you need to decide to like yourself now. And I just made that decision. And it was such an epiphany to accept myself as I was not perfect, <clears throat> not bad, you know, and just, um, just to like myself. And it was a huge, huge step. I can certainly relate to everything you just said. I'm curious. And, and also I'm, I have, you know, uh, an abundance of quotes from your book and it, it, it makes me want to, um, cite this one where you say it's how you feel about yourself inside that counts, not your external accomplishments. And I think a lot of people try to fill this hole in themselves by proving themselves, right? Oh, well, if I just do X, Y, or Z, then I'll feel worthwhile and then I'll be worthy of other people's respect, et cetera, et cetera. But it can be 
a never ending quest because oh. right. So, so it's that, that quote is, is actually very powerful. Uh, it's how you feel about yourself inside that counts, not your external accomplishments. Mm. For some people, there are no, there's no end to the external accomplishments they need to pursue, and they may never get to that that point that you got to. So, do you, do you remember how old you were roughly when you kind of mm. came to that realization and that decision in your life? Yeah, I was I was 24. That's pretty young, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And and. One of my favorite quotes in my book, which I'm trying to find. Oh, is it um, the, uh, the Shakespeare one? No, it's from uh, Cool Runnings. Oh, yeah. Um, where in Cool Runnings. Uh, let me see it's, it, it opened one of the chapters, as I recall. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I'm a big fan of movies, man. <laughs> I... I have redefined myself from uh, watching movies. And mm. um, <clears throat> I watched the last <clears throat> scene, I guess it is, from Tin Cup every night for 30 nights. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> movies are powerful. A lot oh, of people so don't uh, uh, realize it. But um, where is that? Cool Runnings where the coach comes in and finds one of the Jamaican bobsled team guys sitting on the floor. I found and the I quote, by I the way. Read it. I found the quote. It's, it opens up uh, the, the chapter called The Tenth Lesson. Okay. And the quote is, by the way, the chapter is called Seek Peace Within. And it's Arguably hmm. the most powerful chapter in the book, but I'll leave that up to you to decide, dear reader. <laughs> uh, the quote is, a gold medal is a wonderful thing, but if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. Exactly. <clears throat> so somebody can have a goal to run a marathon, be a CEO, climb Everest, make a gazillion dollars, but <clears throat> if you're not enough inside already it's it's not going to change anything and that's why some people are just you know <clears throat> on this hamster wheel run what yeah for continually chasing stuff and they they never get satisfied and it's um um <clears throat> and i i'm probably fortunate for the time traveling that i've had and I spend a lot of time in introspection, you know, just thinking about stuff and, um, you know, rather than um, running here and running there. And that's what I love about walking. Mm. And my whole life's been about walking and it still is about walking um, and taking people on walks. And I'm always getting people to slow down and, and just, <clears throat> hey, be here, be here. Let's not talk about where you're going next week, where you, what the last safari you were on. Look at, look at, look at this. <laughs> look at this and be here now, be here now and just being quiet. And <clears throat> I don't think a lot of people, you know, take time for that. You are so speaking my language. I can't tell you. I, one of the earliest blog posts I ever wrote was called the most effective antidepressant and it's all about hiking yeah <clears throat> so you Absolutely. didn't do well you didn't do well in school but you had this passion for climbing and getting your hands on anything and everything related to it learning as much as you could about it learning the history of it learning techniques and obviously this wasn't all just reading you were out there so tell me about some of those pivotal early climbing experiences you had in Australia growing up? <laughs> <laughs> I know. we. How many hours do we have, right? Well, but <clears throat> yeah, people wouldn't believe it. I mean, I was 12 years old in boarding school. My parents were in Pakistan. I'm in boarding school in Australia. <clears throat> and we had three semesters, trimesters, whatever you call them. 
And the rules were you could only go away for the weekend two times a semester. For some reason, I don't know why, they let me go every weekend. Get out of here, Gary. (laughs) They're probably like... (laughs) And... They didn't ask me where I was going or how I was going to get there. We just, I, maybe you had to fill out a form that you were, and I'd say I was going climbing. And so you'd send in a, a list to the, uh, um, the place where we ate, dining room, and they'd give you a box. And we'd come back on a Friday night, pack our bags, hike a couple of miles to the highway. It was 60 miles to the cliff. So we were hitchhiking on a Friday night. <clears throat> Sometimes we'd have to hike up this eight mile road on a Friday night in the dark. And then we'd get to the campsite. And back when the other climbers from the university had cars, they would just come out for the day, right? Because it was an hour's drive. <clears throat> but but um, we didn't know any of them. So we'd hitchhike out and we'd often, you know, fill up our water jugs and hike to the top of the cliff. So we were there early for more climbing. Mm. So we'd get there at 12 o'clock at night and we'd sometimes get there and it'd start raining. And we knew that, okay, we're not going to be able to climb and nobody's coming out (laughs) to take (laughs) us back home because we would find these climbers and we would beg them to, you know, give us a ride back. But basically every weekend I went climbing and I would drag out different friends until, you know, I found um, a, a good partner and we would go every week. And, you know, during the week we'd read about the guidebook. Okay. What, what it was so exciting. What climb are we going to do next weekend? And <clears throat> the cool thing about climbing is there's different levels of climbing, kind of like skiing. And you could think, okay, maybe next weekend I'm going to try a black run. And you read about the black run um, and, and the same with climbing. So, you know, we'd, um, we'd be um, trying different climbs and every climb was a different experience, a different adventure. And we'd, uh, as, a, as a climbing team, you know, I might say, hey, Greg, I want to lead this climb and so you'd you'd have the choice to do a number of different rock climbs a weekend and push yourself or not it was up to you it was kind of cool and in a in a couple hour rock climb you know you can have the highs and lows of you know being scared to death and exhalation of getting to the top or the the feeling of failure of not pushing yourself enough or doing something wrong or being in a very dangerous situation so in a few hours, uh, a rock climb can be a very emotional roller coaster. Looking back now at the kinds of things that you were doing with just buddies, unsupervised, uh, how dangerous do you, when you think of what you did, how risky, how dangerous was it? Do you, how do you see it now? I think that's a very good question, but Eric, I was, I don't believe it was dangerous because I was very uh, studied. I was very careful. And as I mentioned, I asked a lot of questions um, and um, <clears throat> I've had numerous friends have accidents. I've lost over 35 friends in the mountains. Um, I had uh, one fall when I was 14 and fell down at the start of a rock climb and scratched my leg. And since then, I've never had an accident. I've never had a client have an accident. And so I actually don't believe it was uh, dangerous because I was very careful. I wasn't Mm. afraid to come down if I didn't feel that it wasn't the right situation. Or I often went with my gut. And I'd been on mountains and I just said, no, don't feel good about it and went back down. And I've done some um, <clears throat> serious uh, rock climbs where a fall would be um, fatal. And um, I only did it when I felt good about it. So, <clears throat> you know, dangerous is a relative term. Um, 
I've done a lot of road trips in the U.S. and I've seen uh, drivers taking more risks on freeways, <laughs> That's you know, so try, true. trying to get to work on time, you know, <clears throat> and people say, you know, we're crazy climbing mountains, but, you know, it's all, it's all uh, relative. And hmm. um, I feel like, you know, what I did was um, very, uh, very calculated and um, very much under control. And, you know, it's interesting. And you've been to the Dolomites where, you know, you have all these windy roads and there's these motorcyclists that hmm. are just like Duke on Ducatis and overtaking people and taking a hundred risks a day. Climbers aren't really, very few climbers are thrill seekers. It's a very, you know, calculated, you, you don't, you don't, decide you don't continue to climb with a partner that's crazy right because it's just you know choose your partners wisely that's one of the chapters choose in your, your book pie. exactly and it's it's feeling good about who you're climbing with and knowing that they're safe and they have their act together and that they're um listening and um so yeah it's um <clears throat> people think climbers are crazy but they're not they're very calculated and under control. I know that Reinhold Messner was a huge hero of yours. I imagine perhaps still is. And Absolutely. In, in preparation for this interview, one of the fun things that I did was I went and watched a bunch of climbing movies. <clears throat> and cool. um, interestingly, Reinhold Messner was appeared in two of them. And uh, the, the, the quote that I pulled this from is a film called The Alpinist. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, and it is about a Canadian climber, and I have his name on one of the pages that I've printed out here somewhere. So once I find it, ah, here it is, Mark Andre Leclay. He was in the film. He was the alpinist in the the film of that name. And Reinhold Messner says the following at one point in the film. He said, "Because because the the kind of climbing that um, that Mark Andre was doing for the most part was free soloing." And I don't know right. if you if you did any of that uh, and what your thoughts are about that. But uh, he, here's the quote from Reinhold Messner. Solo climbing on a high level is an expression of art. The art of surviving in the most crazy situations. And then he goes on to say, maybe half of the leading solo climbers of all times died in the mountains. And this is tragic. And it's difficult to defend. But there is a philosophy for going in on, for going on an adventure. You need difficulties. You need danger. If death was not a possibility, coming out would be nothing. It would be kindergarten, but not an adventure and not an art. Well, totally agree. <clears throat> yeah um <clears throat> yeah you know uh for me my <clears throat> and i've climbed uh solo climbed a few rock climbs but nothing nothing that spectacular but you know certainly climbing denali was my hmm alone in a day um that was a, a big deal and reinhold really inspired me and um my vision my goal was to try and do a one day uh solo oxygenless ascent of everest um and um which has been done um and and that to me seemed the pinnacle and uh yeah when you're <clears throat> when you're i don't know top of your game and you feel really good about what you do and how you do it you want to challenge yourself and um you know when reinhold and uh, peter habler went to climb mount everest without supplementary oxygen you know they said we we um are willing and we believe we are climbing to our deaths wow so so they saw this thing they wanted to accomplish no one knew if it was possible 
but they were willing to, and it was the, it's not crazy. It's just the utmost expression of a person's art, I believe. And it, and it was for me where I felt so good and so in tune in the mountains and the alpinist, um, you know, what he was doing was, I mean, I was soloing things like Denali, which are, you know, walks in the park can, compared to <laughs> what this guy was soloing, just a whole nother, a whole nother level. And the whole climbing world has, you know, when I was climbing full time and the Australian rock climbing system is uh, one number. <clears throat> it's a very simple one to infinity. The hardest I ever climbed after three years of full-time climbing was 24. Um, uh, they're now climbing grade 40s. Oh. <laughs> you know, well, th so. this is the story of, of human progress, isn't it? Um, yeah. Pushing the mm -hmm. limits. This is what humans do for better and or worse is they naturally want to see where the limit really is, not the presumed limit, and and push themselves. And sometimes at at the expense of their of their lives. That does, you know, that is that sure. is. Uh, and yeah. you know, it's yeah. People say, oh, this person was crazy, or that. But, well, you know, was Krista Columbus crazy, or Captain Cook crazy, or all the people that you know flew into space and did all these things, which you know. They don't call them crazy, but <laughs> well, I'm it's sure like back the people then, that people the people did. that lived that that lived to tell our heroes. And I think, um, and, and they, you know, and, and you know, if they had not survived, then they would have been seen as a fool, right? Um, and I think Alex Honnold, the climber who famously was this in the featured in the film Free Solo, who did El Capitan, completely without any equipment whatsoever. I thought that was the most insane thing I'd ever seen in my life until I watched The Alpinist. Um, but uh, Alex Honnold made that comment that like, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you actually live to tell, then you're a hero. But if you don't, you know, then you're a fool. But you're the same person either way, you know? Um, yes. And uh, there, here's a quote from your book that also stuck out to me. Living life at the level of performance that makes us push ourselves and create adventure is an amazing feeling. I believe that we reach a level of internal peace when we are living true to our nature, internally satisfied with ourselves, busy pursuing our dreams, and operating at the upper edge of our ability. Wow. I think yeah. that says it. Uh, yeah. But I, I also appreciated, Gary, that you talked so thoughtfully about the way that you approached climbing and that you had the quote sense of no like when you felt it was dangerous you turned back when you felt you, know, you the way you approached it the way you describe it is you were not out there recklessly you were you were stretching yourself you were challenging yourself but you did it with a thoughtfulness that is so lacking in in everyday common activities that you like you say with motorcyclists speeding up winding roads i see this all the time out where i live in southern california people driving crazy recklessly um and so it's interesting that maybe it's not the activity as much as it is the thoughtfulness or carelessness with which it is approached that 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 equals dangerous sure um yeah there's a lot to what you just said but <clears throat> makes me think of um there was a time I was on Denali uh, in Alaska for two weeks before I, um, and I tried the, for uh, the one day ascent a couple of times. Um, and it was on my third attempt by myself that it happened. But before that, I, I just had this epiphany one day, I was doing like a training climb and it was almost like the mountain spoke to me and it said, you know, Gary, the mountain's not out to get you. You know, it's not up there throwing rocks down or throwing avalanches down there. You know, if you <clears throat> if you come with um, the right attitude and the right respect, mm. um, <clears throat> you know, you're in the right place. Not like the mountain's going to respect you back, but um, um, but 
the mountain wasn't out to get me. And I kind of applied that to life and that life wasn't necessarily out to get me. And I think some people think that way. And so they're trying to fight back at life as opposed to, you know, more going with the flow and, um, a and lot being, of these... being a humble student of life. <laughs> yeah. And, um, um, I'm appreciative of every day and everything that happens to me. And, and I just try and make the most of it. And I, I think that, um, um, you know, I, I basically wake up with a to-do list and what am I going to do to move forward in my life towards what I want to achieve. And um, um, that's always worked for me. And I'm, you know, I, I'm just, I don't sit around watching video games. I'm moving towards continually towards my dreams and goals. And I did that with climbing. And, you know, the, the, the cool thing about mountaineering was that I always had a goal. You know, yeah. every two years I had a major Denali, Aconcagua, you know, Everest, um, which, you know, uh, motivated me to train and to prepare and to learn and um, um, and that sort of set me up for other things in my life that I wanted to accomplish. It was, you know, the next, the next mountain. Um, and, um, you know, your, your shows about uh, being the person you want to become. And uh, this evening when I looked out on the view of this beautiful place, it's like, I, I feel like I've done okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw your own words right back at you again. You have a quote in your book. Life is more meaningful and more fun when you awaken every day to the possibility of fulfilling your dreams. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and just taking one step at a time, you know, what do I, what do I have to do? What, and, and I encourage people, you know, go to a coffee shop, order a cup of coffee with a piece of paper and think about what do you want your life to look like? Where do you want to be in a year, in five years and 10 years and write down what you need to do to get there. And yeah, it's those little steps and just start okay when am i going to start okay i need to declutter i need to get out of debt i need to because the goal is down here but what do you need to do now to position to yourself make that happen to position yourself yeah taking steps going back into your chronology and your biography um tell me about the hills updated Age 21. <laughs> um, oh, it's kind of a long story, but a fun story. So I, I, um, uh, my father was military, you know, we didn't have a great relationship. He wanted me to, he wasn't so keen on my climbing, um, wanted me to go to university and become someone and um so i ended up getting I, I wasn't very good at school ended up going to adelaide uh in south australia starting university and it just didn't work out for me so i dropped out um and um went full-time rock climbing which is what i really wanted to do and so there was within in adelaide there was like within an hour there was 10 different cliffs and so i would you know, everyone else was working during the week. So I'd just repel down these cliffs and look for different climbs. And I started putting up all these new rock climbs and about 200 of them. Um, and um, uh, uh, I figured I needed to record them because the first person up a certain way gets to name it and grade it and give it a description. Hmm. And, um, and what's cool about that is that it's history forever. So the first person up 
the Salathe wall in El Capitan has their name on that climb forever. Um, and so I just decided, okay, if no one else is going to make a guidebook, and back then it was, I can't even remember, it was like these printing machines and it wasn't even copy machines, it was collated. So, you know, I wrote it, I drew the maps, hmm. I, you know, uh, bought the paper, cut it, printed it, stapled it, and then walked into the climbing shop with 200 books and basically said, do you want to buy these? So it was a fun, it was a fun, um, just a fun project. And, you know. Wow. Do you, do you have a copy somewhere still? I do. I do. I don't know <laughs> if I do here, but somewhere wow. I do. Yeah. That's very cool. Now, I know that uh, short, just a couple of years after that, you left Australia. So tell us about what that was, what was behind that decision <laughs> and what that was. Yeah. About. Yeah. Um, I went on a climbing trip and I was literally halfway up a climb and it just hit me. It was like, Gary, you're done. You're done. You need to go to the mountains. And I, um, I was like on a 12 day climbing trip with a buddy in Queensland, like 3000 miles away from where we lived. And, um, I said, sorry, man, I'm done. So I hitchhiked back, um, and um, went uh, and stayed with a buddy in Sydney, worked with him uh, for a year, saved up. I worked two back-to-back -back jobs. And back then in Australia, it was very common to um, travel. And we were always going to the airport and seeing people off who were traveling for one month, three months, six months, 12 months. <laughs> and people would work and save. And you know, you wouldn't go to dinner you wouldn't buy alcohol, you didn't go to the movies, you stayed at home, you worked, you saved your money, you didn't have debt, it was back before debt. Um, and I worked two jobs back to back, seven days a week, and uh, saved up a bunch of money and bought a one way ticket, I wanted to see the Himalayas. So I bought a one way ticket to Calcutta, which was the cheapest place I could could get to and I hopped on the plane with literally a day pack a passport a one-way ticket to Kathmandu and ten thousand dollars and hmm. not you know and that was back before the internet so you know you didn't have hotels booked you didn't know anything and from there talk um, about an adventure you know, oh unbelievable and it was a three-day overland trip which I could write a book on itself to Kathmandu. And then I ended up going trekking, you know, to Everest Base Camp on my own, which was an incredible adventure. And, you know, I saw the Himalayas and just fell in love with them and the Sherpa people. And, um, you know, <clears throat> um, started climbing big mountains. How did you overcome the language barrier at that age back then? Um, you know, for whatever reason, I think, you know, uh, when I was six weeks old, I went on my first international trip. My father was sent to Pakistan as part of the military, and my mother was pregnant with me. Um, we came over. So this first of my life was um, uh, in uh, Pakistan, but I've always... Um, maybe just acting dumb or, or something, you know, people have, I've always been able to uh, understand people and they understand me. I, my wife is Slovakian. We met um, 10 years ago in, uh, in the Dolomites. Um, this is actually the view from our balcony, from our apartment. Um, I think what I'm seeing, because it looks like you have on Zoom a background screen that's saved that looks like the dolomites it is so, that's the that's the view from our oh you're apartment. kidding me <laughs> yeah it was <laughs> yeah unbelievable i unbelievable. thought oh gary doesn't know what he's talking about he yeah. has a picture up there <laughs> so wow. long story but i've you know, I work in a in a valley in the Dolomites where they speak Italian, German, and Latin, a 2,000-year-old language. I take people hmm. to Croatia and Slovenia. Um, 
and Nepal, and um, now I live in Slovakia. So, you know, and I've, I have really good memory for some things like trails and, but <clears throat> words, you know, you can tell me a word in Italian a thousand times <laughs> and I still won't remember it. So, um, <clears throat> but I, I'd heard about a, one of my, one of the lodges I stayed in um, said, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, you ought to check out this bar because I was living in this town called Kovara. I said, okay. So one night I finished early with a group, walked outside, didn't know what I was going to do. And I didn't really go to bars, but I saw the, the name of the, the bar across the street. And I said, oh, I'll go in for a drink, walk in, see one woman in a black leather, white leather jacket at the bar. And somebody calls my name. And I wasn't the kind of guy to go up to somebody at a bar. And there was a bunch of waiters that worked in the hotel where my guests stayed who were having a little party. And so they came over and one of them came over and introduced me to this woman sitting at the bar. And so here's me from Australia working in Italy, happened to go to this bar. She was from Slovakia working, happened to have a night off, happened to invited, be invited for a drink. And, um, there happened to be a waiter that we both knew who spoke Slovak and, and, and introduced us. And basically he said, she spoke, and I joke, she spoke three words of English, which was leave me alone. <laughs> um, but um, but uh, yeah, she didn't speak any English. So we had no verbal communication. And he went on to say, hey, this is a really cool guy and you should open your heart. And, you know, you guys would be great together. And we ended up together. Unbelievable. So, yeah, pretty crazy. We had, uh, um, <clears throat> everyone then left and we were walking across the street to this other hotel, which my guest stayed in. They had a jazz player there and she sat down to me and grabbed my hand. And, um, you know, it was, uh, we didn't see each other for nine months and she started learning English and, um, um, which is still very fun to this day because she speaks to me in a combination of German, Italian, Slovakian, English, but I know what she's saying. Huh. So, um, it's very fun, but we, um, yeah. So we got married three years ago in New Zealand, had a two and a half month honeymoon driving around new zealand so yeah am i living the life i want to live yeah absolutely congratulations and that is that is remarkable and somehow perfect given your history of traveling the world i know i know and so now i'm living in the center of slovakia we bought half an acre and um, put a little mobile home on it and having construction done to make it um you know, how we like, and we live in a little town of 500 people and we have mm. awesome neighbors that come over for drinks and we go over to their place and um, has a beautiful view of the, the mountains in the background. And, you know, I've got a very busy summer coming up um, with lots of uh, people coming over to, <clears throat> to walk with me. So that's really cool. I love it. I'm going to throw another uh, quote uh, from your book at you because it, okay. it was another one that struck me. You say, I learned through rock climbing that I would push myself much harder and be far more motivated to train for something if I wasn't completely sure I could do it. Mm. Yeah. Tell me about mm. that, mm. Where, wherever that takes you. Um. <clears throat> Well, it's, um, I was very motivated by what they call um, first ascents or new routes where you didn't know the outcome. <clears throat> you didn't know if you could do it. So it's probably like a, you know, skier or snowboarder trying a new, a new uh, maneuver, a new um, flip or something. And, you know, what motivated and excited me was not knowing the outcome, not knowing if I could do it, um, but pushing myself. So for me, yeah, trying McKinley in a day, I didn't know if it was possible, never been done. 
Um, that's what motivated me. Um, not knowing if I could climb Everest without supplemental oxygen. That's what motivated me rather than, you know, being like, and not putting anyone down, but um, <clears throat> putting on, I knew I could put on an oxygen tank and probably get to the top of Everest. So that didn't motivate hmm. me. Um, what motivated me is pushing myself to, you know, um, to try something I didn't know if I could do. Fascinating. That's, that's really interesting. So can you think of uh, examples outside of mountaineering where this same ethic ethos applied, where you weren't sure if you could do something, but the challenge of it was somehow s seduced you? Would you, I mean, yeah, like maybe, I mean, I'm thinking about your book, Summit Strategies. Um, how did sure. that, how did that come about? And was that, I mean, you know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but was that something like, wow, I don't know if I can actually pull this off. Sure. Well, when you use the word seduce, it makes me think of, you know, walking over to that jazz bar with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. She wasn't my wife, but, right. um, you know, I'm here with a beautiful Slovakian woman. I mean, what am I going to do? And, um, but yeah, with some, you know, I always had this goal of writing a book. It was just one of those things, you know, write a book and, um, um, <clears throat> to write down some of the stuff I'd done and some of the stuff I'd learned. And, you know, often, you know, I thought I wrote a book to help myself more than anyone else, but I've been very humbled that people have, enjoyed it and learned from it and um so it was more um you know just that goal and so you know i researched okay what do i have to do and and i had um and now you know self-publishing is pretty easy but uh back then i looked at the publishing route and you know i did the research and i wrote and i had 40 rejection letters from publishers and 30 rejection letters from agents. And, and then I heard about this, uh, uh, maybe it's the Maui writers, um, conference conference. And you can send in a one, you pay a hundred bucks. You send in a one page synopsis of your book. And there's a wall that all the people that go to this seminar, three or four day seminar, walk down the hall and they can read these synopsis. <clears throat> and there was a couple that had trekked in Nepal, happened to be literally the same month I'd first trekked there. And they had a small publishing house, which later published The Secret. So they mm. did very well. Wow. And they were cool people. And um, I flew out and met with them and you know, they gave me a, an advance and I spent six months writing the book and I'd get up at nine o'clock in the morning and I'd sit down at the computer. And um, <clears throat> during that time, I got invited to go back to Everest and made the decision. I'd pretty much retired, but uh, from mountaineering and decided to go back. Um, and um, so basically finished it up before, um, before going back to Everest. And then I had a, a, a two month road tour and I traveled around and gave talks uh, about the book and which was um, pretty depressing actually, cause you know, you'd drive 500 miles and there'd be six people in the <laughs> audience and you know, you'd sell one book. <clears throat> um, but, um, and I remember years later, you know, a friend said, uh, well, how's your book doing? And I was like, you know, um, I don't know. Um, I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Right. You did your you know, part. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have the goal to be on the New York bestseller list. I didn't plan to make a certain amount of money from it. Um, years later, I had a friend who um, <clears throat> worked with Lance Armstrong and he called me and said, Hey, you know, I want to write a book and da 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 about my involvement with Lance. And I said, Oh, great. You know, what's your goal for writing a book? And they said, To make 
he said to make money. And I said, ah, wrong answer. Hmm. You know, that's, and probably I'd say that with everything, you know, <laughs> don't do something to make money, you know, follow, follow your passion, you know, what. Well, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir again here. Uh, I can't get enough of it. And, and I also really appreciate also hearing the backstory of that book, because here's, you know, my experience of the book is I, you know, came to a talk of yours back in 2011 and I uh, purchased the, a copy from you directly and read it at the time and was totally inspired by it and, you know, recently reread it and was inspired all over again by it. And it definitely touched me. And, you know, the fact that you, you know, this book wouldn't exist hadn't it uh, dawned on you to write it and then come up with a, a solution for yourself of finding a way to get it published after enduring all those rejections, which I'm so glad that you told it, told us that story because that is so par for the course. And it's, you know, things that we, we appreciate today and we take for granted, like, well, of course this exists. Not, it wouldn't have if people hadn't created it and gone to the trouble of putting themselves out there and risking rejection and being rejected endlessly. I mean, the Beatles were turned down by every record company in America, every last one. And they said they were told guitar bands are on the way out. That is not of interest to people here in the States. The Beatles, for crying out loud. So, right. it, you know, it's um, so it, it, I always appreciate hearing those stories, the sort of behind the scenes stories of, you know, the less glamorous aspects of um, of things coming to fruition and, and uh, people. It, it's so clear to me also when I experience something that is a, a passion project, that is a labor of love versus just something that's created commercially to cash in. And your book, you know, is so heartfelt. Tell us, I mean, tell for people listening, I'd rather it come from you. Tell us how you structured the book. Cause I think that it's a very uh, appealing has a very appealing structure that that keeps people wanting to continue to read it to the end. And it's it's not that long of a read, but you're compelled to continue because of the way it's structured. Well, that's very humbling. I call it a good airplane read because it <clears throat> it is pretty easy, um, pretty quick read. Uh, you know, I I um, <clears throat> a lot of people have a goal to read it, write a book, and <laughs> You know, you sit down at the laptop and you go, okay, okay, what am I going to write? You know, it's, it's tough. And I went back and forth um, with different ideas. Okay, I was going to be walking down the trail in the Himalayas and talking to a Sherpa who fed me these wise words. Um, I hired a, uh, what do they call it, editor flew out, interviewed me for three days, sent back some stuff. I didn't like it. Um, and so, but I read, a, I, and I've read a lot and reading has really defined my life. I read a lot of personal help and self-development books. And I read a book um, and I'm going to forget the name, uh, but, but it was a guy who was a Navy SEAL. and he wrote a <clears throat> best-selling author, did some work with some Hollywood people, and he wrote a book about his SEAL experiences, and he would tell a story of a, a SEAL, Navy SEAL encounter, and then how that related to business, and I just loved it. And that's, <clears throat> so I can't take full credit, so that's how I thought, okay, I can tell the stories and it was almost like I was writing to, to remind me what I learned from that experience. And so it was kind of fun saying, okay, Denali, what did I learn from that? El Capitan, what did I learn from that? And getting it down on paper. So, <clears throat> and once again, we get back to steps. You know, I looked at it at one chapter at a time. Don't look at the whole book, but mm. what's, so for me, okay, 10, what do I call it? Lessons. Can I remember, Ten, you know, lessons. So what were the lessons? What? And so I could either go back to, I could start with the mountain or I could start with the lesson and <clears throat> try and combine them. And, and I would, and there was, you know, like lighten your load. 
took yes. me three three hours to write. Huh. And most people say that's their favorite chapter. Yeah, um, I, I see why. I've had I had chapters that took me three weeks to write. So yeah, it's um but that's how it came about. I, I read a read another book that I thought this is this is a good format for me. I'll tell my story and then tell what I learned from it. Yeah, it works so well. And you know, you generously pepper uh, different climbing stories throughout the book, but there's also a continuous one that you use to open each individual chapter. And there's a cliffhanger, pun intended, <laughs> uh, you know, that keeps the, that what is what I was referring to. So what is the one continuous thread, the story that you tell over the course of the book that, that opens each chapter? Well, it's, um, you know, when I was my lifelong dream to be part of a Everest expedition and this was before guided trips so this was 1991 when there was 100 people on the mountain and we were all essentially um perfect not professional but um experienced climbers so there was no clients uh or paid people on the mountain and um <clears throat> i was invited to go and it was a, a great experience but um <clears throat> yeah i had enough you know, pretty much a near-death experience on Everest. And so I got to um, uh, learn from not getting to the top hmm. and what that meant and, you know, how that affected me. So a little bit in the book, I, I write about, um, you know, that, um, uh, yeah, and you can have these goals and sometimes you don't uh, achieve them, but you can learn more from not achieving them <clears throat> than, you know, if the weather's fine and you just slog up this hill to the top, you know, what do you really learn? It's in the, the hard decisions you have to make to turn around and survive. And so I was caught out. I made the decision to, um, um, help a teammate with uh, the water that he needed. And then I had, had helped another teammate carry his pack. Uh, and um, so there was, um, I sacrificed my ascent to help the team effort, uh, got lost in a storm, you know, literally. Um, it's a harrowing story, by the way, to read. Yeah, could have, uh, could have easily died, but um, <clears throat> kept going. And, uh, and then when you get there, you know, 20, then I had to wake up and go back down, uh, which was so some of the toughest days of my life. But, um, you know, I learned uh, an incredible amount uh, about myself uh, from that, um, which I now, I guess, apply to the rest of my life. Beautiful. Uh, I resonate with that deeply. I think that that's very powerful. Yes, when uh, when things are easy and everything and is, you know, kind of tailor made for you to succeed, what do you really learn from an experience like that? It's it's you learn from being tested, from being pushed to your limits, from being forced to tap into your deepest resourcefulness, and maybe you achieve the goal and maybe you don't. But it's and I'm going to again quote from the book because I think that it's beautifully stated. You say here. In the end, it would not be the mountain that I conquered. I might stand on the summit for a brief moment, but my achievement would be conquering my own doubts and fears. And then uh, more specifically to this idea of, you know, not making it to the summit. You, you write, as you identify and rise to your own standard of excellence, your own standard of excellence, not someone else's, like in your case, for you, the real challenge was to ascend without supplemental oxygen because you felt that was, you weren't sure if you could do that. So the quote again here is, as you identify and rise to your own standard of excellence, you will realize that what you learn and what you become while you pursue your goals is more important than actually achieving them. Absolutely. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
So to um, to wrap this up, I'd love for you to tell us a bit about your company, Right Path Adventures, and the the experiences that you provide for your clients. How did this company come about? And tell me what it's all about. Well, <clears throat> thanks so much for asking me about that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been involved in um, adventure travel. Um, worked for a couple other companies, um, started my own company, taking people to Nepal for many years. And, you know, had sort of a following of friends and people that would want to come back on trips. And when I turned 50, I um, uh, took six months off and happened to, you know, have a beautiful place in Park City and, um, sat down and thought about, okay, what do I want to do for the next 50 years of my life? And um, I think it's a great exercise actually to, um, you know, if you could do anything, what can you do? And I had yellow sticky pads and I wrote different things that I liked doing or that were important to me. So I can't remember exactly, but it was, you know, being physical, um, spirituality, traveling, um, teaching people, helping people. Um, and I <clears throat> had them on a piece of paper and I realized, um, you know, I still wanted to be in the travel business, but I wanted to create something different and unique uh, and um, came up with the idea of um, this right path. Uh, and I wanted to keep myself on the right path and taking people on the right path. And so fortunately the domain name Right Path Adventures was available. What and, year now um, are we talking? Uh, 2009. Okay. And, but what's interesting is I really didn't have a, a place that I was excited about taking people to. And then I was living in Park City and they have the big outdoor adventure trade show for all the companies in Salt Lake. And I went and I picked up a couple of magazines on the way out. I go for inspiration and look for ideas and meet old friends. And I was flipping through this magazine. There was an article about the Dolomites. And I'd read about the Dolomites when I was 14 years old back in boarding school. And um, actually um, said to my girlfriend at the time, um, um, you know, I've always wanted to go to the Dolomites. Uh, and she, she said, I love Italy, let's go. So we planned a trip for a month. I did a ton of research for six months, which was very difficult to find uh, at anything and uh, flew over there, fell in love with the place and thought, man, if I love this, you know, incredible hiking, incredible food, clean, safe, you know, it's Italy, but it's it's the Austrian influence. So it has the flair of the Italians, but the order of the Austrians. Very clean, very tidy, very orderly. Um, and, um, um, you know, came back and I, I went, decided to go back for the next summer for four months, looked at my money in the bank and thought, I can afford to go for three or four months, you know, just flew over invited some friends to hike with me, a uh, few built a website by myself on, um, you know, some simple site. And, um, you know, people resonated with that. And um, so the first year I had 20 people, the next year, 30 people, the next year, 40 people. And, um, you know, so I've taken well over a hundred groups, have a fully booked year this year. And, you know, I have people say, don't you get tired of walking on the same routes? And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I have different weather, different yeah. lighting, different people. And it is, and I've been all over the world. It is, to me, the most beautiful, incredible place on the world, on the planet. And I know you've been there and I just love what I do. And I run back-to-back -back trips. At one point, I, I used to take a day off between trips and it was like, oh, this is terrible. I'm sitting at, in my apartment, tapping away on my laptop, you mm -hmm. know? So I do one trip after another and I get a lot of private groups, a lot of families, a lot of friends. And, um, 
Absolutely love it. And, you know, in each valley, there's the best hike you can do. And so um, I can't wait to get back. And if, if the Dolomites was open, because it's, you know, a ski town. So in the winter, it's skiing, then there's mud season, and then there's the summer, and then there's, you know, winter comes in. If it was open all year, I'd live there and mm. I'd take people on hikes every day. I love it's it. That's so beautiful. I, I, there's a quote. This one is not from your book. <laughs> there's a quote that is deeply meaningful to me. It's attributed to Christopher Morley. And it reads, there is only one success to be able to spend your life in your own way. And to me, Gary, you exemplify this quote. You're, you're living it. You're creating, you're doing the things you, you consciously deliberated on what is it that I love that is most important to me? What is, how do I want to live my life? And you have, maybe it was step-by-step, step, I'm sure it was, once again, you figured out how to combine, take all of these elements and combine them into an, a, an ecosystem where you get to, where, to, to use an expression I love, you get paid to be you, <laughs> right? Yeah to do yeah. what you love, to share it with other people. And um, what a blessing. What a blessing it's been for me to have this conversation with you and to reconnect with you after so long. Thank you so much for everything. Do you have any anything else you'd like to share with our audience about becoming the person you want to be? Huh. Um, well, I've really enjoyed this talk and it's humbling um, and it's humbling in my business because, you know, I have people coming back on their second, third, fourth trip, and they literally email me and say, Gary, we have eight days. Take us where you want. And <laughs> We're in your hands, right? Yeah. Don't ask for an itinerary. Very humbling. Very humbling. So um, they let me do what I do. And when people let me do what I do, I do it really well. Hmm. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. The, the only thing I'd probably say is, um, um, you know, if, if, if what you're doing in your life isn't working, then look at changing something. You know, get a coach. Get, a, get someone you can talk to, someone you can learn from. And... Um, ask advice and then follow their advice. Take those little steps day by day to change what you need to do. But I'm a big believer in, to, in you know, finding someone that has answers to help you move in the direction that you want to move. And, that, and the great thing about that is you feel really good about yourself. And when you feel good about yourself, you know, the world blossoms people notice that and doors open doors open to um confident people and you'll become confident and feel good about yourself when you're moving in the direction of what is important to you and what you're passionate about so i just encourage you to you know grab a cup of coffee and think about what's important to you what are you passionate about and just start moving in that direction and look for look for experts like um the guy i'm talking to here and uh, you know <laughs> a guide um, perhaps maybe i don't know if it's a guide expert. a guide, a guide. yeah yeah well, part of what i yeah part of what i do is i feel like i need to walk my talk if i'm going to be coaching other people if i'm going to be helping them tap into their own sense of what is meaningful to them and stretching their own comfort zones, I have to be doing that as well. And so it's a wonderful, Absolutely. it's a wonderful system of, you know, stretching myself and helping others do the same. And you do Absolutely. that as well on your, on your trips and give people unforgettable life experiences and memories. It's humbling. I, I can't believe the life I live. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gary. Keep on living it. And hopefully we'll connect again soon. Take good care. Look forward to it. Namaste. Namaste. See you,